And there we go. So we are now being recorded. So um, welcome everybody to the March 5th, 2024 presidential primary election worker training session. Um, thank you for all, you know, the work you've done in the past and for all the work you're going to be doing in the future, hopefully, and for your you know willingness to help us out and work the elections. Um, we're gonna do the presentation shortly, but um, you know, actually let me get that started now. I'm gonna share my screen, just one second. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, okay, good. All right, just hold on one second. Okay, okay. Um, okay, good. So this is pretty much the same as the last time because our office hasn't changed, but it's myself, it's Amber Martin and Angela Hilliard, your town clerk staff extraordinaire. No. <laughs> um, so as a worker on election day, your objective is to give all um, the, the, to basically ensure that the voters who come in to vote are able to receive the most courteous and efficient service as possible so that they are able to vote. You're the first point of contact, so your smiling face is the impression they get when they come in and when they leave. Our polling places have not changed since the last election, so they are still in the same spots. So. Um, just take note. If you are working in the Bangs Community Center, you will receive a parking placard to park in the parking lot around the building. And just some general information. Um, polls are still open from 7 in the morning until 8 p.m. And those of you who are in the opening session, we ask that you get there for 6 a.m. because you will be needing to you know, spend the first hour setting the polling place up. Um, we are going to have all the polling places set up this time before the election. There should be no difficulty with bringing in tables and chairs and having them out and ready for you to go. In September, that might be another story, but we're working on it. Um, any kind of food that you might need, please you know, plan on bringing it with you if you're, if you're working an extra long shift. We will provide name tags. We ask that you wear them so that the voters can you know, identify you as they're, as they're in the polling place. And of course, as with any election, talking politics is strictly forbidden. Um, you're there to do a job. And if you want to talk about anything that's going on in the world, then you can do that on your break outside of the polling place, outside, keyword. Um, the perception is always the big thing when people hear poll workers talking politics. It's it Sometimes we'll get back to the Secretary of State's office, and then we will get a phone call. So we don't want that to happen. And of course, you know, it goes without saying, all, all voters should be treated with respect, courtesy, and same level of service. Oops, too fast. Okay, so just a reminder, who does what? So the warden is your chief election official at the polls, and um, they're in charge of everything. So if there's ever a question about anything, go to your warden. They are going to be your supervisor. They'll tell you what to do, um, and they'll gauge it based on, you know, either interests, like do you like doing check-in? Do you want to be at the ballot box? Um, you know, what your talents are. They'll try to match you to your position. And sometimes it depends on the place, but sometimes people like to switch things up and rotate. You know, different things happen in different precincts. They also are in charge of handling any inactive voters, any challenged voters, or any provisional voters. And basically, they maintain order and handle all the violations. Now, the clerk is uh, works alongside the warden. They have their own table. They're the official record keeper for all the facts relating to the election, as required by law. So they're going to record any unusual happenings. They're going to record, um, you know, if there was a provisional voter, they'll record maybe the lights went out for a second. Uh, they'll record all kinds of things like that. Um, when ballots arrive, if there's another delivery during the day, you know, things like that. They also are supposed to be the ones who read and record the ballot box register before and after the election. So they're gonna say zero, they're gonna look at the uh, ballot, the, the um, tabulator count and say zero votes. And at the end of the night, they're gonna say, okay, we got 2,100, well, we never get that many, but 585 voters voted today. And now for you guys, you're election workers. So you um, are going to be assigned to either the check-in table or the ballot transfer box. And those on the check-in table are going to be asking the voter for their street name, street number, and then their last name and first name. 
We're going to locate them on the voter list and check them off in a red pen or pencil, but it must be in red. Just, just want to, you know. And, um, and then the second person at the table will be handing out the ballot. So now we'll talk about that in a, in a couple more slides about the ballots because this is a primary. So we have three different ballot styles, one for each party. And then the constable preserves order. Um, they make sure all the election laws are being enforced. They are the ones, if there's anything happening where the warden needs help, they will stand and you know come in in the defense. And they also stand at the end of the line, if there's a line at the end of the night at um, eight o'clock when the polls close to make sure nobody sneaks in after the polls are officially closed. All right, and what you're gonna see, this all gets delivered election morning by the constable. So there's going to be a tabulator which sits on a ballot box. That's what the uh, ballot goes through and gets stored in during the day. And then there's also an auto mark machine, which is the handicap voter assist machine. So if someone comes into the polling place um, and either asks for help in voting their ballot, or you know you see somebody with a uh, maybe a cane or a guide dog, you can always offer that machine for them. And what that machine does, it's a marking device. It doesn't tabulate the ballot; it just marks it for them. But it allows them to use Braille or a headset. Um, I think that's it. Um, so you know, it, it's 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 there for their convenience in case they need it. So, let's see. And so basically. Um, the tabulator itself, I think I talked about that. We have the new image cast tabulators, which I hear everybody's loving, which I'm really happy about. I heard they're very easy to use and the manual that goes with them is very, very easy, self-explanatory. Um, so the it like the old tabulators, the ballots are placed through this tabulator. They almost look like the old ones, but they have more information on them. Um, so the ballots go through that tabulator in any orientation. And sometimes, you know, your tabulator may not, for those at the ballot box, um, if the ballot won't go through in one orientation, let's say head first, face up, just flip it over and try it head first, face down, or foot first, face up, foot first, face down to get that ballot to go through the tabulator. We haven't had too much trouble with that. So hopefully it's again, not gonna be a big deal. But um, so that's the tabulator. And the LCD screen is great because it's a nice big screen now. It notifies the voter in case they've misvoted their ballot. So in other words, they could have um, voted for two when it's a vote for one race, which means that would be an overvote. The tabulator will not accept that ballot. It's going to give them a message saying there's an error on your ballot in race, whatever. Um, so you basically just note, you know, let the voter know, okay, there's an issue with your ballot. Um, please look at the screen and decide what to do. And we'll be going into that further in, in some future slides. And then that, that ballot box is that big black receptacle where the, where the tabulator sits on and the ballots get inserted into. It diverts all ballots with write-ins to one section and all ballots without write-ins to the main compartment. But that stays locked and that secures all the ballots on election day. So the opening procedure, so again, you know, you're there bright now early at six o'clock and, um, and so the warden's going to assign duties to everybody, but you're going to physically set up the polling place with, um, you know, a, a, the, the check-in table will be there. Um, you can set up a guardrail. So the guardrail is nothing more than putting tape on the floor um, outside of the check-in table, which tells any observers that they cannot enter into that voting space where the check-in table is. But it should be close enough to the check-in table. So your warden will figure out where to put it. But basically, that is what it's for. It's to keep a line between observers and the voting process, but close enough so the observers can hear. Um, there'll be voting booths already set up, uh, the voting equipment and the accessible voting equipment will all be there. And then information has to get posted. So you need to post three specimen ballots in each party. Um, there's a three trifold, po well, there's a trifold poster you need to put up three as well, which includes the instructions, the penalties and the voters bill of rights. And um, one set of the specimen ballots needs to be posted no higher than 48 inches from the ground for accessibility. And then once everything is all set up, the polling place must be unlocked at least a half an hour before the polls open, so it's 6.30, so that the public, if there are any people, they can inspect the voting equipment to make sure that everything is, is good to go, that there are no ballots in the ballot, ballot box, which the tabulator is sitting on, um, 
you know, that gets open publicly to display, okay, it's empty, okay? So the first ballot is going to be the first ballot. Um, and the auto mark needs to be set up and turned on and tested as well. And the ballot that does get tested through the auto mark, and that, and that is when there's time. So that doesn't have to get, if you're running short of time, that can get done as soon as possible. Um, but that ballot that gets voted or marked, it's not voted, but it's marked, will be spoiled and then given to the warden to be put into the spoiled ballot envelope. Okay. Okay. So now this is this is this is the most important thing I want everybody to take away from this training is that this is a primary. So as a primary, there's three parties: um, the Democratic, the Republican, and the Libertarian. And they're color coded. The Democratic's orange, the Republican's blue, and the Libertarian is purple. And what I want you oh, and so what's on each party ballot? You've got the presidential preference, state committee man, state committee woman and town committee. And I've had a lot of questions in the past about town committee. And what that is, is a group, um, there's a, there are only two, there's a Democratic and Republican here in Amherst. Um, and what their job basically is, is to support their Democratic or Republican candidates. So they have caucuses, they've got one coming up, I think in a couple of weeks. Um, but they're basically, they're like cheerleaders, I guess that's the appropriate word. Um, so they just do whatever they need to get the word out on their candidates, who they're supporting, that sort of thing. Um, so you're going to see for the on the Republican ballot, there are five people running for town committee. And on the Democratic ballot, there are 18 people listed. OK. All right. This here's the numero uno important slide. So as a check in worker, you know, check a worker at the check in desk. When the voter approaches and you find them on the voter list, you're going to see either a D, an R, or an L next to the box to check off, okay? Or a blank. They'll, they'll be either printing there or no printing there, right next to the checkbox. So if there's a D, that voter can only receive a Democratic ballot because they're in the Democratic Party. They cannot, at that point, on election day, say, oh, I really want a Republican ballot. Too bad, so sad. You know, it's just too late. They have to make a change before the last day to register, which is this um, Saturday, by the way, at 5 p.m. So that's the ballot they get. Same thing for the Republican. You know, they're in the Republican Party. That's the only ballot they can get. And for the Libertarian, that's the only ballot they can get. So now those voters who are unenrolled, they are the ones where you'll see the checkbox with nothing, no letter printed after the checkbox or before, I forget it's before or after. We'll see on another slide, I can't remember. So they get to choose which party ballot they would like. Now making that choice will not enroll them in that party. They will stay unenrolled, okay? That, that was something that happened about 20 years ago, I think, and people still remember it. So that doesn't happen anymore. So say they want a democratic ballot. You check them in, you've checked them off, you've given them their ballot, you've offered them a secrecy sleeve. They've, they've probably declined, but now they go off to the voting booth and they start voting. Well, two seconds later, they turn around and they come back. And they say, you know what? I really don't want a democratic ballot. I want a Republican ballot. Again, too late, too late. Once you've started the process, you know, they've started the process, you've checked them onto the voter list, they're done. They have to vote that ballot. So just keep that in mind. And now also, this is important too, um, an unenrolled voter, because there's no letter next to that box, the check-in box on the list, you have to write it down. And the reason behind this is that, so after the election's over, we take that voter list and we scan every single voter that voted. So we look for the check marks and we, we scan them into the voter registration system. Now, if there is someone who got checked in on the check-in list that does not have a party printed next to that checkbox, and nobody wrote down the party that, that uh, the ballot that voter took, we cannot scan them in. So that has ramifications because this voter list that gets checked into the, um, scanned into the state voter system is something that every voter has access to. They can, they can go through the Secretary of State's website and look up, they can look up all sorts of things, you know, did did the town clerk get my request for an early ballot? Or did the town clerk, um, did it show that I voted? Um, different things. 
you know, am I registered to vote? So basically, if they look after the election to make sure that we receive their ballot, that their ballot counted, and they don't see anything because we could not scan them in, they're going to be upset. They're going to say, what's going on here? Okay, so very, very, very important. Just remember to please write down the ballot taken when they're an unenrolled voter. And that same applies for, you know, it's not just unenrolled. Some people are registered in political designations. And some of those are, I've got the lists on my wall here. Um, we the people, um, time sizing, not downsizing, the Socialist Party, the Unity Party, the Pizza Party. So all sorts of interesting <laughs> political designations. There's, there's about 20 of them there, maybe. Um, so if they're in a political designation, they can vote. This is a primary. Anybody unenrolled or in a political designation can vote. They have to choose their party ballot, though, so out of the three. But again, you've got to write down what party ballot they chose, OK? Um, let's see. I think I've beat that to death, OK? So <laughs> any questions at this point? And you know what? I'm looking for raised hands, but my screen is not very good. You can just unmute yourself and say something if you want. No? All quiet? Okay. Well, I'm just one one oh. question I yes. have. Is, I, I guess it seems to me that we ought to say to anyone sitting at the table should say to the, tell the unenrolled voter that once they take the ballot that they need to stay with that one just to avoid any, you know, so, so we'll inform them of that hard and fast rule, right? Um, I'm just thinking of how we have an election worker, you know, and you're in the front of your voter list, your um, check-in voter list. You've all noticed we have instructions to voters and then we have a sign-in sheet after that. So on that instructions to voters, I think we can add um, notify voter once party ballot chosen, um, then they, they cannot, I, we'll figure out a wording for that. Yeah, I, I, I've been thinking about that one. I'm going to write that one down. Can I ask a question yeah. about party designation? Sure. So if somebody comes up to you um, and you're you're at the desk and they say, you know, I'm a socialist uh -huh. and you say, OK, which one of the three do you want? Uh -huh. And um, they can take whichever one of the three that they want and they can write in their own candidate no matter which of the three they take, right? Like, let's say the, I don't even know if this is true or not. Let's say there's somebody that they want to write in who's a socialist, that they can actually take any one of the three ballots and write in their own person, right? Well, they can, they always can write in anybody they want, whether mm -hmm. it's going to qualify afterwards, that would be up to the Secretary of State's office. Mm -hmm. But they and a voter always has a you know option to write in a candidate. Sometimes on um, you know if that person's not, it depends on how that person is running under which party, and whether the voter chooses the right party ballot to put that candidate on to. Do you know what I'm saying? So if they write in a libertarian candidate and they write it in the Republican section, it may not count. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. Okay. I'm just wondering because that may well be a question that somebody asks us. Well, you're not there to provide information. So don't, I mean, you can give them basics on how to vote mm -hmm. um, and what the laws are on, you know, the ballot choices. But as far as education, that's not your job. It's up to the voter to educate themselves before they step into that precinct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that's why also there's a five minute rule inside the voting booth there's always been a five minute rule, which, you know, I don't, I don't, this, this election, we've gotten about 3,100, maybe 200 now requests for early ballots, which is a good amount of people. So I have a feeling if all those, you know, they won't all come back, but if a lot of those people return their ballots, it's going to be pretty quiet on election day. So that five minute rule, I'm not even worried about that. We will be discussing that for the November election though, because <laughs> we want to keep it moving in November because it's going to be busy, but um, yeah. So, you know, but, but I'm bringing that up because, you know, when somebody's in the voting booth with their cheat sheet and notes and all that, trying to figure things out, that's not the place to figure things out. You know, the place to educate themselves and know what they're doing is before they step through the doors. So, 
So again, it's not up to you, but you can, you know, certainly tell them, yeah, you know, we'll work out the wording on once you've made your choice on party ballot, you must remain with it, that kind of thing. And um, yeah, but um, yeah, write-ins and all that, that's the secretary mm -hmm. of state's office. will figure all that out, but they can write in whatever they want. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Right, good questions. You're welcome. Any others or should we keep going? Sue. Yes. Just to reconfirm, for an unenrolled voter, we we write in the D, R, or L next to their name, depending on what ballot they took, just the way it's printed ones are. That is 100% correct. Yes. Yeah. Because if you don't write it down, we can't scan that voter's history. It looks like they didn't even vote. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, so say, you know, you found the voter, they're on your voter check-in list, your active voter check-in list. They've gone to vote, but now someone appears before you and you can't find them. So um, basically what you're going to do is just send them to the warden. The warden will have a copy of the inactive voter list. And they also have a townwide voter list. So they can look and see if the voter is maybe inactive or if they're in the wrong precinct or if they're not registered to vote in Amherst at all. Okay. So, um, so never turn the voter away. You know, if you can't find them, sometimes you have to be a little, um, some of the addresses like, you know, village park, let's say some of the apartment complexes, it depends on how people refer to them. And that may throw you in looking things up. So, you know, if someone says I'm at like 14 village park, so you're going to go to the V thinking it's under V, but it's actually not. That particular address is East Pleasant Street. It's 497. So, you know, the, but these are the things sent to the warden and um, the warden can take care of it from that point. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, I think we already went over this, but we'll do it real quick. So the check-in table, you know, is the first point of contact. So, you know, it's nice to be pleasant. And the voter is going to give you their street name, street number, and then their name. You're going to repeat it. I didn't mention that. You will repeat it. And the reason for that is for the, if any observers are there, that they can hear it. Because the voter's back is going to be to the observers most likely, and they're not going to be able to hear as well, whereas you'll be facing them and they'll be able to hear you. And this is also election law. <laughs> so you're going to, you know, repeat it in a voice loud enough so that the observers can hear. And then once you find the voter's name, use a red pencil or a red pen. Don't use black. When we're doing the check-in afterwards or, or the scanning of the check-in lists and we're going down that list, black blends in and we don't see it. So red, red stands out. And then again, don't forget to mark the party ballot. And I've been told um, you can put D and R, but you can put DEM and REP as you, if you'd like also, or LIB. Um, sometimes people's handwriting might look the same for some letters. So to be on the safe side, why don't you put DEM, REP, and LIB, okay? All right, let's see. And we've discussed this too already. So a voter may ask for assistance or you may note that they might need assistance. So offer that auto mark machine. And when you're offering, when you're giving the voter the ballot, you offer a secrecy sleeve. So that is that cardboard like um, sleeve that they can put their ballot into. And it's basically not for carrying the ballot to the voting booth, but it's from the voting booth to the tabulator so that nobody can see how that voter voted. Okay. And most voters, I think, don't bother saying, yeah, I want one. I think they just yeah take their ballot. Okay. We talked about this already. I'm a way ahead of myself here. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now, on the voter list, you're going to notice that some voters need to show ID, and there's a few reasons for that. Um, so Help America Vote Act started this whole thing back in, I think it was the early 2000s, and um, it'll be highlighted, not highlighted, it'll be bolded, and voters that re registered by mail but did not provide identification or their numbers that they put on their voter registration form could not be verified, they need to show ID. So they're going to have that ID requirement on the voter list. So you will, um, this is a, a case where you can call the warden over because this can be recorded in the clerk book. They're going to note that so and such voter needed ID and yes, they satisfied the ID requirement. And then after the election, we can go in and look at that clerk's book and say, oh, that person's 
fulfilled their ID requirement and we can take that requirement off of their, their um, what do you call it? Voter record, record. That's what I'm looking for, record. Okay, and acceptable identification must contain the name and address as they're registered to vote. So when you find them on the voter list, they have to show you something that matches that voter list. Not where they're now living, maybe they've moved, um, but it's got to match the voter list. And different kinds of ID, uh, driver's license, state issued ID card, anything with their name and their address printed on something. So utility bill, rent receipt, copy of their lease, their voter registration affidavit, anything, paycheck. Um, and they can also show this to you on their phone. It doesn't have to be a hard copy, okay? Here we go. Here's a sample of the check-in list. And the letter is next to the box on the left. So you can see the first one there, one person, person comma one, the L for libertarian, there's your check box. And then the second person down, test comma mister, there's nothing written next to his, um, nothing printed under the party next to the check box. So that's where you will write in the party that that person, if they came in to vote, um, chose. Now, if you see an X in the box, and on, on the um, top of the boxes, the header name is called voted. That shows that we received a ballot for that person one way or another. So either they voted during in-person early voting or they requested a mail-in ballot, either absentee or early, and they returned it. If there's an X in that box and that person shows up in front of you, they cannot vote because they've already voted. That ballot is now at your precinct to be processed. So we do not want to, you know, nobody votes twice. Um, so keep your eye open for that. Of course, you'll see it anyway. If they show up and, the, you know, you're looking, you're like, wait a minute, this one's already marked off. But um, in that case, if, you know, you just let the voter know, I'm sorry, we've already received the ballot for you. And if there's an issue, just send them to the warden. And... This is a situation, so somebody's at the ballot box, you're, you're the ballot box monitor for the for the day or shift or whatever, um, and the voter comes over to you and, and, and you know, spoiled their ballot. Basically, they don't know where to go. They may not go directly to the ward and they may come to you or to the check-in table, but they made a mistake. So they get to spoil their ballot twice and then they have to vote the third ballot. So if they spoil their ballot, then the warden will step in and, you know, make a note, um, write spoiled on the ballot, put it in the appropriate envelope and then walk the voter back over to the check-in table to receive a second ballot or a third ballot as the case may be. And we talked about this too. So the ballots can be inserted into the tabulator in any orientation. So when the ballot is good and it goes through, there's going to be a green check mark display saying ballot accepted. And that happens pretty quickly. And it's good to, you know, let the voter know once they put it in just just you may want to say, just wait for the check mark and then you'll know you're all set. Sometimes people walk away quickly and not to worry because that green check mark will display, but then it will go away. And you won't, you, there's no um, wondering whether it was accepted or not, because if it's all set to accept the next ballot, then it obviously accepted the last ballot. Okay. If there's a problem with the ballot, it's going to display a message and that's not going to go away until it's been dealt with. Okay, so, but it's best if the voter sees that it's gone through, then they have that satisfaction of their ballot's been cast, they're good to go. Okay, and then so now these messages all come up. So the ballot gets, um, if there is a problem, the ballot's going to get rejected due to an overvote, which again was like they voted for too many candidates in that race. Um, you just ask the voter to please read the LCD screen and follow the directions. So they, they have choices um, depending on what the, you know, the message states, but if it's an overvote, they can choose to receive another ballot and mark it appropriately, or they can mark, they can choose to, you know, process that ballot as is. They may say, I don't really care about that race, put it through anyway. And then you would just follow the directions on the LCD screen or the voter would. Okay. If they need help, they can ask you, but the voter should be responsible for reading the LCD screen and following the directions. Um, is there any, are there any questions at this point? I heard somebody, yeah, Richard? Yeah, um, on, going back to two slides, not the previous one. Uh, if someone has received an early ballot but hasn't returned it, they can vote, but does that mean that the, the, uh, the early ballot will not be accepted? Yes, correct. Yep, so um, first of all, 
they're voting on election day. And if by some chance they return their ballot to our office after they voted in, on election day, we have to, we have to process all those ballots through. Um, he's going to, they're going to, at some point it's going to, I think I know where your mind's going. I am thinking, are you thinking how would they get away with voting twice? Is that true or no? Well, I'm wondering how, how the system pre prevents that from happening. Yes. Yes. Oh, there's lots of checks and balances. So first of all, they, number one, if they just change their mind, I don't want to, you know, vote by mail, they vote in person, they're done. The ballot that they have at home, you can tell them, destroy it, throw it away. And that's the end of that. But say they're a sneaky person and they want to see if they can beat the system or whatever. Um, so they voted in person on election day, and then they hand deliver their mailed in ballot to our office because it has to come to our office. You cannot accept them at the polls, okay? So they brought it to us. We process it. We have to log it into the voter registration system as returned and accepted because we don't know at this point that they voted in person, correct? So then what we do is we have it delivered to the polls. The minute it gets delivered to the polls, you're gonna see that they've already voted in person on the check-in list and you're gonna reject it. I see you're trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, so it gets it gets it gets caught at some point along the way, depending on how it's you know done. So, and Joel, you have a question? Yes. Yeah, so, if a voter comes with his mailed-in ballot to the to in person and says, "I have it here," can they should deliver it to you? They could deliver it to your office on voting day, or can they? just take another ballot at that moment uh, would we give them another ballot and they would tear up their old their so depending on so in person and election day are two separate things so on election day we're talking um if somebody comes in and wants to vote on election day and has an early ballot that's been delivered to them they destroy it they vote the one on election day during in-person early voting if they deliver mm -hmm a ballot that they got by mail and they voted it, you can accept it and just, you know, you give it to us. I mean, you're, you're right next door. Just bring it over to us. Um, but if they bring it in that they got by mail, but they want to vote in person, you can still give it to us. We'll destroy it. They're going to be voting in person. Yeah. Yeah. Does that okay. answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking of a person who had who physically on election day brings in his mail in ballot, but is and is requesting a ballot at the desk, at the check-in desk, what do we do? Do we tell them to destroy the, the mail-in ballot? Yes. At that point? Yes. You can't, so you're talking a voted mail-in ballot. Yeah, yes, let's say they have, yeah, they physically have the ballot with them. So if, they, if it's voted, they have to bring it to our office. If it's not voted and they're just carrying it with them because they want to, they didn't vote it and they want to vote in person instead, you tell them to destroy it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go over that because we did a bunch of times already. Okay. And we've talked about this too. So the voter, you know, um, we, well, we already talked about, it. I'm not going to talk about it again. And we looked at this. Okay. So, so for this election, here's something new. Um, normally we deliver all of the AV and EV, you know, the absentee and the early voted ballots to the precincts, unopened, all lumped together in their piles in, you know, order of the voter list for you guys to process at the polls. But this time we're gonna try something different. Um, the the new election laws of 2020, when COVID hit, a lot of, a lot of the rules changed to make it easier for everybody, you know, because of COVID. Um, one of the things that they are allowing us to do is advance remove ballots. So we are going to have a, an advance remove session on uh, March 2nd, Saturday. And so what that is, is um, we're gonna take, we're gonna have some teams of, of election workers and follow the you know Secretary of State's instructions on what we need to do. But basically we're taking the ballots out of the envelopes for all the mailed ballots and we're checking them off the voter list. And all of those ballots that have been removed from the envelopes are going to be sealed in their own container. So those are all considered advance removed ballots, and they will be delivered to the polling place 
And all you guys have to do is put them through the tabulator. Okay, so no more opening envelopes and taking them out and checking them off the voter list. We're gonna do that ahead of time. So hopefully that saves you a lot of time. Um, and, you know, there still will be, so because that's on a Saturday, ballots will still be coming in all the way up, you know, up through and including the end of election day. So there will still be ballots that we will be delivering to you in the envelopes because we can only do this advanced removal on a, in a posted section through the Secretary of State's website with notification and all that sort of thing. So um, those will be delivered as usual, how we you know normally deliver them to you, but we'll probably deliver those like early afternoon, mid-afternoon on election day. Don't expect there'll be too many because we're just talking a day, two days of ballots. Okay, so... Yeah, and there'll be, you know, everything's going to be divided by precinct, I mean, by precinct, by um, party. The Democrats will be rubber banded, the Republicans and the Libertarians, because you, um, the clerk will be keeping track of how many Democratic ballots are there, how many, everything's always kept track of by party at a, pre, at a primary. Okay. Um, let's see. And just a reminder, so, uh, yeah, Joe, so go th ahead. Those, those, pe those, the uh, advance, I don't know, remove ballots, they'll be marked yes. as voted on, on our check-in list. They will. Through Saturday. Yep, they will. Okay. Okay. They will. Yeah. Yep. So you don't have to even worry about it. Those are processed. Basically, you just put them through the tabulator for counting. Yeah. Okay. And then a reminder on the 150 foot rule, um, just keep your eye out for anybody, you know, um, maybe at the check-in desk, you have better vantage point than other people. I don't know, depends on the precinct, I think, but um, just keep your eye out for anybody wearing any kind of election materials, any kind of um, buttons, literature, signs, all of that stuff. And if you see anything, you know, at the check-in table, um, like if it's somebody coming to check in to vote, you can ask them to remove it. Or if there's, it's a shirt printed, take the shirt off, turn it inside out, or cover it up with a jacket, or what have you. If um, if you cap, you know, if you happen to see like if the door opens and you're near the door and you see outside there's signs in the lawn that are close, let the constable know because they need to ask people to remove it outside of the 150 foot barrier. Nothing can be inside the 150 foot of the door to the precinct. And then observers, I think there may be a few observers. Um, I have had a couple of emails. So basically, um, again, what they're there for is to gauge voter turnout. And so they're keeping their lists. They cannot use any of the um, supplies at that polling place, like the electrical outlet or chairs. I mean, you can be nice and offer, this is up to the warden, of course, but, um, but basically they stand there and they listen to see who's come out to vote. They're keeping their lists and and then what they do after that, I don't know. I think they probably go to their campaign headquarters maybe and say, we need to start calling voters in this precinct. Not enough people will come out, you know. Um, but, you know, just repeat the name of the voter again loud enough so they can hear. And um, they're not allowed to speak to you, okay? If they have any questions, you send them to the warden, all right? They can't impede the voting process in any way. Um, okay. And then you've done your duty all day long. You've been, you know, everything's going great. And at eight o'clock, you can announce that the polls are closed. Well, the constable does. And um, the warden's going to tell you, you know, at that point, what needs to be done. So basically all kinds of things. Um, you're going to count the checked in voters on the check-in list, both check-in lists. Um, going to count the unvoted ballots, take down signage, put supplies away. Um, the warden is going to oversee the closing of the tabulator and the removal of the voted ballots from the ballot box. Okay. And they're going to oversee the process for counting any auxiliary bin ballots. Those are the ones that the tabulator couldn't take for some reason. Sometimes ballots are printed funny. You know, there are like hatch marks down the side of the ballot. Sometimes it's off just enough that it just throws the tabulator off and it won't accept it. It could be something as simple as that. But sometimes there are auxiliary bin ballots, so those have to be hand counted. And the warden, I'm not sure how the wardens do it in every precinct, but you may be involved in that process, tabulating or tallying, um, looking for write-in votes, et cetera. And then once everything is done, um, the election supplies that were brought over in the morning get sent back in the afternoon by the constable. So the um, election supply trunk, which holds all the voted ballots, 
the warden's box, the election supply box, and the um, tabulator. And that is the end of this. So um, thank you, everybody. And any other questions? Well, if, <laughs> if you don't have them now, if you think of something afterwards, feel free to email me anytime. But the biggest, biggest, biggest takeaway is don't forget to write down the party ballot taken for those who are not in any major party so that we know which party ballot they took so that we can scan their name in on the voter list after the fact. Okay. Um, let me so stop I, sharing my screen. Let me see. Do, there we go. Yes. I have a question that I maybe somebody else has the answer to. And it's it's related to this. I, I got a W-2 that has zero in the um, earnings box from the town. And my program says I can't file, I can't e-file if there's a zero in the dollar, in the, in the earnings. Oh. Which You'll have to call Marty um, in accounting. Marty Rad Radkowski. Let me see, hold on one second. Let me give you a phone number. There is yeah. a box 14, which has the amount. Yeah, but it's, I don't know. H&R Block says I can't file electronically if there's a zero in the dollars earned. You know, in the, Use the TurboTax. <laughs> <laughs> I, All right, I, here's Marty. I mean, his, yeah, here, okay. let me give you Marty's phone number. It's 259. 259. 3165. 3165. She'll know. She'll know. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I see Elaine's hand up. Elaine. Yeah. Sue. Sorry. Quick question. Um, uh, I'm down as an inspector, and I'm blanking on what that means. That's an election worker. So basically, you're doing either yeah check in or ballot box. Thank yeah. You. Okay. You're welcome. And Richard. Yeah. Um. You mentioned something about March second. What's that? March. Oh, March second is the day we're going to be advanced removing of the ballots that's a saturday so that's just for us that's the okay. day we take the ballots out of the envelopes all those mailed ballots yeah got yeah. it okay 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 and ed um with that advanced removal of ballots uh the observer with them taken out and then putting in a stack the observers would not hear the names like we used to do. Oh no, 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 no. We're gonna have you'll you'll be there. You're gonna hear. There'll be instructions. We're gonna be actually doing it like like we're at the polls on election oh. day. We're gonna say the name and because they do have to have an opportunity to challenge. So are the observers also gonna be at there on Saturday? It's an open because... process. Yep. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Well, it, I don't know if they're going to show. I don't know if they have enough interest, but it's it's going to be posted. It's going to be posted to the Secretary of State's website and the town's website. So, you know, if they are watching these things, they'll know. Yeah. OK. OK. And uh, I have a that, question. That, Deb? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this might seem um, very uh, trivial, but this is the first time I've heard that I've always used to hear that as far as talking politics is, of course, not, nothing related to the election at hand. But this is the first time I heard that we can't talk any politics at all. So like national. You really, national well, you really election. shouldn't be because you're there to work. You know, you're there to work. You're there to do a job. Yeah. And it's just, you know, people come in. They don't know which election you're talking about. You could be talking about something really benign. And, but they hear something politically slanted. It's okay. just, it's all about perception. Yeah. I got okay, it. good. Okay, thank you. All right. And I don't see, do I see anybody else? No? Well then thank you for showing up everybody. And I hope everyone has a great day and everybody put out good intentions for March 5th that we're gonna have a fair weather day. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Goodbye all. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. You're welcome.